Before getting into the thick of things today, I'd like to say some words about Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens was no stranger to the local area in northeastern Pennsylvania. In October of 2010, he attended the Pages and Places Book Festival in Scranton, Pennsylvania. He honored his appearance in Scranton despite his cancer diagnosis in late June of 2010. Some, including Elizabeth Randall, co-director of the Pages and Places Book Festival, were concerned that Hitchens would not be able to attend and were shocked to hear that he had developed cancer. Randall, one month before the festival, said, Honestly, I have to say that I was far more devastated as a fan first. The idea that that kind of a brilliant mind would be gone from the planet sooner than any of us had anticipated was far more distressing to me. I'm pretty fired up that he's still on the docket to come. Hitchens signed books and spoke at the Authors of Argument panel at the Scranton Cultural Center with Scranton native and author Jay Perini. Despite his condition, reporter Rich Howells for the local publication Go Lackawanna wrote, Hitchens was his notoriously outspoken and controversial self, targeting, many, among other topics, organized religion, terrorism, Prince Charles, and Mother Teresa. I was able to ask Christopher Hitchens a question at the end of the panel discussion, which was, what is the best advice that you have for anti-theists today fighting back against religion? Hitchens responded saying, don't keep the faith. Earlier in the day, I spoke with Christopher Hitchens. I had a picture taken with him and had three of my books signed. We spoke about Joseph Ratzinger, Mother Teresa, Bill Donahue, and the December 2009 holiday display controversy in which I was involved. Hitchens had a suggestion for the residents of Luzerne County and the commissioners. The people should read their constitutions. Informed about some of the hate mail I received, Hitchens laughed and advised me not to allow people to get ahead up on me. After leaving the table and allowing others to get their books signed and meet Hitchens, I told him, thanks for coming out, and he responded telling me a story about a comment former Senator Larry Craig made using similar words at a press conference stressing that he wasn't gay. The cancer did not diminishes, diminish Hitchens' sense of humor. Yes, uh, Hitchens did have a great sense of humor. And I'd like to say this about Christopher Hitchens. Uh, without a doubt, Christopher Hitchens was one of the secular movement's brightest shining stars. Um, and a true inspiration to me as well. I admire his head-on, no-nonsense approach to exposing all the BS that religion is made up of. And I loved how he expressed his views. Um, he'll be missed, but his words will be eternal. We'll start the podcast with general news and information about the NEPA Free Thought Society and discuss today's topic, Curious Bible Verses. After some discussion of the topic, we'll be taking some viewer calls from Skype. You can see the information on the live stream page for those listening. The Skype handle is NEPA Free Thought. The NEPA Free Thought Society is a secular discussion and activist group located in the northeastern Pennsylvania area. The group is intended to be a coalition of non-believers comprised of atheists, secular humanists, skeptics, agnostics, etc., predicated on support and community. The group gathers monthly to discuss any pertinent issues and fully intends on defending the rights of the secular when and where appropriate. We maintain that the separation of church and state is important and critical thinking should be prevalent in all areas of life. More information about the NEPA Free Thought Society, including upcoming meetings, special guest speakers, and much more, can be found at nepafreethought.org. Our podcast is available for free on the iTunes Store and through nepafreethought.org. You can also subscribe on our website through the RSSS feed. This is our fourth podcast episode, the first three episodes on the topics of morality, faith, and race and religion are available online. We will be having a very special episode of the NEPA Free Thought Society podcast recorded live on December 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will be debating Reverend Marcel Dotson of Field of Grace United Methodist Church on the topic of Does the Christian God Exist? You can tune in live at nepafreethought.org slash news slash live stream. We will also be taking viewer calls after the debate. For those of you who will be listening to this podcast after the 19th, and those of you listening live, you can find a recorded video version of the debate on our website and a podcast when it is available. Comments, concerns, questions, and suggestions can be sent to jvacula, that's V-A-C-U-L-A, at nepafreethought.org. You can also find this email address in the contact tab at the homepage of our website. In January, we plan to have Sean Faircloth, author of Attack of the Theocrats, on our show. We will also be meeting on January 28th of 2012 for a special meeting at a private residence. 
Physicist Dr. Tom Kincannon will be speaking about cosmology. We will also be including a special seafood buffet. So for those of you in the area, we hope to see you out. Today's topic is curious Bible verses. During debates and discussions with theists, I am almost never one to discuss or argue Bible verses because I like to stick to the arguments and come from a philosophical perspective. However, many theists can take the Bible very literally and proclaim that the Bible is the good book. They will also claim that they get their morality from the Bible, so this topic can be worth discussing. Okay. Yes, um, there are some curious verses in the Bible, many curious um, verses. One I'd like to touch on would be slavery at this time. Um, the Bible promotes slavery and even gives rules and regulations for slavery, so you would, one would wonder how theists, or Christians in this case, would say that they have a good moral basis when they get their morals in the Bible according to them. So it is curious. That's one of the things. And there's plenty of um, passages in the Bible that are very clear as to um, basically how, how slaves should behave and uh, how masters should treat their slaves as far as... They don't say anything about treating a slave well or, or good. They talk about beating slaves and um, using trickery to keep you as a slave and things of that nature. So once again, like I said, I don't understand how... Uh, the Christian could say that the, the Bible was a, a moral, a good moral um, book to uh, get your morals from. So some of the apologists will say things like, well, um, that it wasn't like the South, and slavery was different back then. And some will say that it was like indentured servitude. So what, what would you say to that? I've had debates, and I've gotten that also. Um, one passage in, uh, in, the, in the Bible, it's Exodus 21, 20 through 21, beating slaves with rods specifies how the, the master of a slave can beat his slave with a rod, I guess if he's not happy with the slave, and he can do so as long as the slave doesn't die within a couple of days. If the slave dies within a couple of days from the beating of this rod, then the master is supposed to pay some type of penalty. But the slave doesn't die, there's no penalty, everything is just fine and dandy for the owner, for the master, the slave owner. So um, when they try to say it's indentured servitude, to my knowledge, indentured servitude is, a, is an agreement made between two two people where one's going to work for the other uh, to pay off a debt. There's no ownership there no, either. No ownership. He's trying to pay off a debt that he incurred um, through, a, through a contract, a contractual deal, agreement. So when you go from a contractual agreement to uh, paying off a debt to beating the person that owns you the debt with a rod, that is, is a big leap there. Um, that that would that would take you from take it from being a, a agreement into a ownership where you're beating someone and uh, dictating to them. And it's kind of weird. We talked about this in the last episode that some African Americans will defend these kind of things. Yes, they do. Considering we can see that Christianity was used in the past as a justification for slavery. So how do how do you feel about that? Um, as I said in the past, I think it's a, it's a based on education. Um, most of um, African American theists I've met haven't studied the Bible. They don't know a lot of these passages exist in the Bible. They usually get the good stuff when they go to church. There's things that sound good. I don't think they went to church and the pastors would say, well, we're going to be advocating slavery today, everybody. They might well start clapping. They'd probably be saying, well, wait a minute, uh, what's this? Even though, even though it's in the Bible. But once shown this or uh, the words are spoken to them, at that point they can understand that this is not a good thing, and if they do believe it's a good thing, I think something's wrong with them morally. A lot's wrong with them morally. They think it's a good thing to own another human being, beat this human being with rods and stuff like that. Yeah, so the game is out on that one. Yeah. In, in Judges, there's an interesting story about a man who's called a mighty man of valor, and his name is Jephthah. Here is Judges 11, 30 to 31. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatever cometh forth of the doors to my house to meet me, when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it, offer it up for burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over to the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. So basically what happened here is Jephthah made a deal with God to win a war, that the next person who would walk through his door would be offered as a sacrifice. So guess what happens? Um, Jephthah's virgin daughter happened to be the next person to come into the house, and Jephthah honored the vow with God, killing her. And Jephthah came to Mizpah into his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with timbrels and with dances, and she was the only child. 
besides her, had neither son nor daughter. And it came to pass, when he saw her, that he rent his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, thou hast brought me very low, and thou art one of them that troubled me. For I had opened my mouth unto the Lord, and I cannot go back. And she said to him, My father, if thou had opened my mouth to the Lord, do to me according which hath proceeded out of thy mouth. And she was killed by her father. So how about that for morality? Well, there's some twisted morality you got going on there. Um, like I said before, anybody that wants to read that, and I think that, that, that that's a good thing, um, there's something wrong with them. Uh, if they do believe it's a good thing, I'd like to hear their explanation as to how that's a good thing. That would be interesting within itself. <laughs> Anyone that truly loves their child and uh, cares would not do something like that. Um, we, don't, we don't see that happening quite you know, very often, people doing things of that nature. And um, as far as I'm concerned, these stories are just based on uh, what they want you to believe, but I don't, I don't see any, um, any, any truth in this as far as um, someone acting, like that, acting in that way, that fashion. So what do you have to tell us about witches and mythological beings? Okay, well, <laughs> there's also belief by theists that witches, sorcerers, demons, devils, uh, so on and so forth exist. Uh, many of these things are mentioned in the Bible as well. Um, one of the, one of the uh, creatures that they talk about in the Bible is a satyr. And the satyr is a type of demon or supernatural being that inhabits wastelands. All right. uh, they speak of, um, well, I know, I know the satyr is supposed to be half, part, part animal. Part, kind part, of a part man. animal man thing. Yeah, yeah. and um, to my knowledge, we've never found any remains of any satyrs here on Earth. I know archaeologists haven't uncovered anything like that. To my knowledge, I haven't heard anything yet. Uh, the satyrs and their flutes. I think it'd be on the front page of the papers if they did. Huh? I'm sure it would be. <laughs> so I don't have any faith whatsoever in any, any uh, the existence of a satyr or anything else like that. So um, once again, this is just based on what they've read in the Bible. There's no proof for any of these things. Um, once again, the Bible does mention many times witches. You remember we had witch burnings. And, uh, of course, if there's witches, there's sorcerers and demons and so forth and so forth. But uh, it's, not, it's not witches and demons and sorcerers. There's, there's people who do evil things, people who do good things. That's what it really boils down to. If somebody wants to jump out, out a window and say, well, I believe that they're possessed by a, a demon or the devil possessed them and turn them into uh, some kind of uh, evil being, I mean, you can believe that if you want to, but it's, it's, it's beyond um, it's beyond supernatural. It's outlandish. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, some people are still being killed today because of this. There were some beheadings in the news recently and some other killings for people who were apparently witches in the Middle East, and it's still going on today. That's just a matter of, of ignorance. And um, like I said before, people need to educate, educate themselves if they can. Apparently, some people don't want to educate themselves and interest in education, interested in just what feels good to them. And... For some people, killing feels good to them, obviously, because uh, apparently they go out and kill people that aren't like them or people that they believe, for whatever reason, are evil. Um, they should be locked away for that. I don't know what's going on as far as any any um, arrests going on for all this, you know, killing of people they believe are witches, but somebody should pay the price. Second Kings chapter 2 has another interesting story about a bald man named Elijah. Little children saw Elijah and mocked him for being bald. And God sent two she-bears to kill the forty-two children. And here are the verses. And he went up from thence into Bethel, and he was going up by the way. Therefore come little children out of the city, and mocked him, and said unto him, Go up, thou bald head, go up, thou bald head. And he turned back and looked on them, cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she-bears out of the wood, and tear forty and two children of them. Matt Slick from Karm.org is someone our readers might be familiar with. He participated in a debate with Matt Dillahunty on the atheist experience. He has the following apologetics for this verse explaining, Why would God allow two bears to kill 42 young lads simply for saying Elijah was bald? Let's take a look. Elijah was traveling from Jericho to Bethel when a group of young men verbally accosted him. 42 is a large number of people, and they were probably an organized group who had gone out to challenge Elijah. Their mockery implied malicious intent, especially when the culture of the time insisted on showing respect to their elders. Furthermore, the statement, go up you bald head, has cultural significance. First of all, go up is probably a reference to Elijah's predecessor Elijah ascending into heaven. In other words, they are stating that they want Elijah gone, 
Also, the epithet bald head was one of contempt in the East applied to a person even with a bushy head of hair. Lepers had to shave their heads. Given the challenge of the youths, their intimidating number could easily constitute a mob. Their veiled threat, the contemptuous attitude, and the fact that Elijah was the prophet of God, the Lord allowed the youths to be destroyed. So what do you think about that one? <laughs> well, so that's a wild story there. <laughs> that's pretty wild. Um, He's trying to justify the killing of the children by the she-bears. Yes. Um, there's no justification. First of all, it's really ridiculous. Uh, two female bears came out of the woods and tore children to pieces. Um... And for somebody, even if, even if it did happen, it sounds ridiculous for someone who's going to be kind of happy about that. That's um, horrific. Nah, you shouldn't be happy. You should be horrified. But don't you think the 42 children could have formed a mob and routed Elijah? I guess they could have, but I don't think that they, that's what was going on. Okay? <laughs> I doubt that's what was happening. Um, it seemed like they were just uh, poking, you know, fun or whatever. But I don't believe that he was in any danger where he needed to uh, um, summon bears or where we uh, sent the bears to, to, to destroy the little children. Yes, he's a druid. He's summoning bears to attack people. Huh? <laughs> That's pretty good. He, um, he, can, he can control animals. So yeah. part of the uh, powers you're endowed with, I guess, once you're a religious person. You know, if, if he were casting spells or summoning or something like that, don't you think he could have just put up a wall of stone in front of Elijah, stopping the kids from killing him? Yeah, he could have done a lot of different things, I would assume. I so God sent the bears to kill the children in this case. Yes, that's the way it sounds. That's the way it seems. Um, like they say, he's a vengeful, vengeful God, and I guess he didn't like what he heard. Those children had to go. They had to go horrifically, I guess. So what's your next curious verse? Well, let's see. We can go into... I'd like to talk about gays and religious and religion and the LGBTA community, to be exact. Um, I find that um, I, I wouldn't really use the word curious in this case. Um, when you have supposedly loving Christians going around saying that um, people who are gay or lesbian or whatever the case might be deserve to die horrifically and, and, and they burn in hell for eternity for not being like them. Um, once again, if you're claiming to be a moral person, I don't see how you can say you're moral if you're telling someone else simply because they're not like you or living like you, but they might not be harming anyone though that they need to suffer, be tormented forever, and things of that nature based on your difference in beliefs. Um, if, you don't, if you don't like um, gay people, I, I wouldn't think you'd be around them or see what they're doing, with whatever they're into, and I would assume you wouldn't be involved in any uh, homosexual activity if you weren't gay. So I don't understand why, how they live their lives would bother somebody. Um, like losing sleep over this here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if I, don't like, if I didn't like liver, I just wouldn't eat liver. <laughs> it would be that simple. So in this not case, going on campaigns against it, though. No. But no. Leviticus talks about shellfish. Shellfish is an abomination right next to homosexuality. But I don't really hear pickets of red lobster. But although Ray Comfort, the Christian evangelist, um, has offered meals to atheists at Red Lobster, so shellfish is okay for some, I guess. I, I know plenty of people who, are, who claim to be devout Christians, and they... Especially on Friday, they had to get some seafood. <laughs> <laughs> We're having that seafood buffet next month, so we better watch well, out well, there. None of them will be there for that, but I've seen plenty of theists run to the uh, local seafood markets and get get their fill. So that's 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 out the window as well, as far as um, them being in keeping with the word. All right. Um, but once again, as far as um, so-called abominations go, if you want to call somebody one of the worst things they could possibly be based on your beliefs, um. You try trying to put somebody else down because, like I said before, they're living differently, but they're not harming you or harming anyone else. Why would you really care what they're doing? You know, it shouldn't matter at all. I've heard a lot of different cockamamie excuses, and none, none of them have stood up to any tests whatsoever. Uh, I've even heard one so ridiculous where somebody said, well, I, I think it's nasty what they do. <laughs> okay, well, you're entitled to your opinion. You don't have to be involved. You don't have to watch or anything like that. So even if you feel it's nasty, how does that translate into they shouldn't have rights, you know? So that's another thing I have to say when it comes to morals, um, the Bible's giving, uh, that's, there's nothing moral about telling someone you're, you're, you're terrible, horrific, because you, you want to be with the same sex. If you don't like it, you don't like it. That's understandable, but don't try to sit there and, and do them dirty by saying uh, they're going to burn and die and suffer and so on and so forth. That's, that's, that's just going way too far. Yeah. So I want to move on to... Um, we're talking about bashing, so we'll talk about bashing children on rocks now. In Psalm 137, how blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones against the rock. 
So here's another apologetic from Karm.org on this one. Paraphrasing, they mentioned that the person writing this was in exile and knew of the captors of his people who happened to kill children by smashing them on rocks. The writer of the psalm then was talking about doing the same thing in revenge by putting a curse on the people. So the article goes on saying, it is worth noting that the Old Testament records many atrocities. The fact that God allowed people their sinful desires and he worked within the culture, even as he does now, as he permits all kinds of bad things to happen. Nevertheless, God introduced what is called the apodictic law from Exodus 21:24, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The law was instituted to prevent the increase of blood revenge, a practice where revenge would escalate out of control between two parties. Since the hearts of the fallen are so wicked, and harsh environment and culture provided difficulties for survival, God has a few options to counter their proclivity toward evil. He can run roughshod over the free will and force everyone to obey him, or he could wipe them all out, as he already had done with Noah's flood, or he could work with the situation at hand. So this is kind of interesting. We have the common apologetic, if God intervenes, people lose their free will. But in this case, why... Why does he have to intervene? Why, you know, th this eye for an eye thing is the best he can do, apparently, it seems. Why not just give them better moral guidelines and say, don't sack villages and hold people captive? That's not um, the game they're playing. <laughs> the, the game they're playing is power. And might makes right, I guess, in this case. As um, a uh, matter of fact, when it comes to my next point I wanted to make about, about this, um, we can look at women in the Bible and look at how they're treated in the Bible. When any time someone says that a woman, in this case a father, can sell her daughter, I don't see anything more about selling your child to a stranger. There's also a part in the Bible which specifies if a woman is being, has been raped by a man, that man can also marry her if he just pays out some money to her father. Um, once again, this is the morality of the Bible. Uh, it's pretty twisted and, and uh, um, depraved, but it, but nevertheless, this is what they claim is the good book. Okay. Right. So there's a lot of a lot of cherry picking that goes on, right? People talk about the good things, but they often don't point out the bad verses. So it seems more like they're not getting their morality from the Bible, but rather that they're bringing morality to the Bible and distinguishing which verses are the good verses and the bad verses. Pretty much. Um, uh, a lot of people I've talked to or debated, like I said before, don't study the Bible. They, um, they, they're they they're just happy to hear a sermon on Sunday and let, let that resonate through them all week long to the next Sunday for the new sermon. Uh, they don't really study the Bible. The, the vast majority of people I've talked to who claim to be Christians don't study the Bible. And um, the reason I say it is because many times I've debated them. I brought up certain passages and they, they tell me they don't, they don't believe that's in there. <laughs> they, 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 don't, they, don't, they haven't seen that in there. And they'll tell me they've been a Christian for decades for a long time and they don't know what's in the Bible. So one of the things I would say to our audience is that if um, for any reason there's any doubt in any of the passages we're quoting or any of the things we're saying uh, and you'd like to call in and, and question these things, we can actually take you to the verses and take it from there. We're not just making things up like some people do. All right, so I'd like to move on to some passages from Second Corinthians chapter 4. This is four one through 4.4. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them." So in this passage, it seems that they're talking about Satan, who is referred to as the god of the world in this passage. So Satan is blinding people from believing, and according to some Christians out there, people are going to be tortured in hell for all eternity for not believing, and Satan is just making that happen. And apparently there's nothing we can do about that, it seems. So according to ChristianPost.com, a blind mind cannot grasp the gospel. St. Paul wrote, the God of this age had blinded the minds of unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel of glory of Christ. If your mind is blind to God's good news, you won't see it until your blindness is healed. Satan blinds man from seeing Jesus as Savior. Your rejection of Christ up to this point is tangible evidence of Satan's ability to blind minds. When confronted with this reality, some unbelievers laugh it off. 
Others get mad. Laughter and anger are the two common responses when a person is informed of his spiritual blindness. A less common response is actually the best. So, Rodney, is your mind blinded by Satan? Is that why you're an atheist? No, I'm an atheist because I have no reason to believe that any god or gods or anything supernatural exists. Um, I don't know anything about a, a, my mind being I'm blind or something like that. Um, but that's the point, right? <laughs> because that's how evil Satan is, that he's tricking you so much that you don't even know that he's blinding you. Well, if Satan is out there and he's that powerful that he's tricking me, and it also, I believe you said that God, let me see, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Now, it would seem to me that if you're already a non-believer, then it says God's going to come along and blind you on top of that. <laughs> that I guess we were You're really, double blinded here. We have a chance to be, to be enlightened then. It's and over. Then, and then the devil is also assisting as well. He's jumping in and blinding us even more. So what can we do? We're just all blinded and we don't know anything, I guess, <laughs> according to this. But uh, no, I'm not blind and I don't think you're blind. I think anything we're um, pretty much <laughs> shedding plenty of light on things. There's no blindness. We can see what's going on. We uh, just don't agree with certain things, and if they want to call that blind, then they can. The only thing blind is faith. That's why it's called blind faith. I don't know anything about it. blind atheism. There's no <laughs> such a thing. So that's that's out the window. That's nonsense. Blind that's mind. that's the buzzer on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's also two. There are also two other Bible verses. Uh, John twelve forty talks about God hardening the hearts of nonbelievers. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, so that they cannot see with their eyes, not understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11 to 12 says that God sends people strong delusions so that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned. So it seems like there's a lot of background stuff going on. So apparently when I'm talking about the reasons I don't believe, the reasons I reject arguments, it's just Satan talking. It's not really me. You just blame Satan for that one. And God, apparently. God's going to blind us. I'm curious as to why God would want to um, have some, make somebody delusional. Why he would uh, give you delusions. Um, I would I would think, now I mean, I can't sit here and speak. If there is a God out there that exists, I wouldn't know it. But if there was one, <laughs> and he was all-knowing and all-powerful and all some of the other attributes they give him, I don't understand why he would need to delude anything. If he was all he said he was, why can't he just keep things straight as they are? and reveal himself or reveal the truth or whatever we're looking for rather than delusion and things of that nature. Yeah, it seems that we hopped upon a contradiction here because earlier we talked about the, the one apologetic about how God can't trample on people's free will because they would lose it if God intervened. Mm -hmm. So God is intervening, intervening, blinding people so that they don't believe and apparently the free will is still there. So I don't really see how that works. Well, that's pretty wild. <laughs> like I said before, it's, it'll take a little time to sit back and... Uh, you know, we through that nonsense. We'll get some, maybe we'll get into this in the debate on Monday. We'll see what happens there. Possibly. It's usually a common response to the problem of evil, that the reason that um, some actions happen is because people have free will. It's a consequence, or natural disasters are a consequence of laws. So say, for example, God would make it to be the case that if I struck a match, I can light a fire. And we need that fire, but then there's also the consequence of people burning buildings. So that's a common apologetic we hear with that. Mm -hmm. But of course, God could simply make things in different ways so that, that couldn't happen. And that would be moral evil in most cases, too, not necessarily natural evil. Pretty much. So what do you have next over here? Well, let me see. Um, basically, what I like to do is, is, since I did mention the fact that we could back up some of the things we're saying with verses... Actually, would you look this up for me real quick? Um, See, what we could do is we could just open up a random page and point a finger and probably find something silly here. Just in case anybody's <laughs> tuning in and doesn't believe things that we're, we're saying, um, we give you a little something. Um, let's go to when it comes to, let's say since the Bible should be a moral, a moral guide, let's talk about rape. Let's see what the Bible has to say about rape. Let's, can you go to Deuteronomy? All right. Well, that's always a good one to go to. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Okay. Deuteronomy 22. 22. 28 and 29. 22, 28, 29. Yeah, we'll say about rape in there. Okay. So we have, If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not bethrothed, and lie hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found, then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel's father fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife. 
because he hath humbled her, he may not put her away all his days. A man shall not take his father's wife, nor discover his father's skirt. Okay. I've heard that same passage, I guess, in different different, uh, different Bibles. His word is slightly different. Okay. This is the Gideon's Bible here. Yeah. I took this from a hotel. What a sin. And on the back of it, we can see handwriting here. And it says, I was here, but now I'm gone. I left my name to carry on. Those who knew me knew me well. Those who didn't can go to hell. Hmm. So here we have um, Appeal to Fear right on the back of the Gideon Bible. How about that? Hmm. Um, let me see. As far as the um, situation that we just talked about with the woman, um, they did, when they were talking about the man and the woman lying together, the, 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 the actual, to my knowledge, the actual story is of a man during those times was to rape a woman. He could uh, pretty much get out of that by making her his wife. Right. And... Um, to me, that seems outlandishly immoral. Um, let's say, for instance, if a guy during those times wasn't very good at speaking to women or whatever, or whatever his issues may have been, women were interested <laughs> in him, I guess his backup plan could be, I'll just rape the men, whoever I think is attractive to me, and I should be forced to marry me. Now, if there's anything moral about that, if any Christian or anybody wants to say it, that's moral, raping a woman so she can be forced to marry you, I don't care what time, what, what era this was, <laughs> <laughs> it's immoral, and then it claims that the father takes money for for the daughter and things of that nature. Um, it's, it's, it's real twisted. Like I said, uh, I, if somebody wants to tell me that that's moral and it's coming from a good moral book, I really like to hear from them as to why they think that's moral. I've had a biblical literist actually defend that one before and said that, well, if she really didn't get the money or married, <clears throat> you know, actually marrying the guy would make it a little bit better, is what was said to Mary me before. Reed. Right, would make it a little bit better because in those times she would often just be killed outright. It would seem to me that I mean I'm not a woman, I haven't been in a, I haven't been in a place of women being has been raped, but I would think that a woman who was raped would be uh, beyond outrage. Okay, I can't see a woman um, having any uh, feeling towards the guy that raped her, whereas though I love you, I want to be your woman, your wife, or whatever the case is. Um, like I said, this is this is just crazy for someone to say. Or to even put it in there and say, well, this is how things went, and it's, it's good to do to live this way, to think this way. Um, when people try to say to me during discussions with the base about this, well, that's 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 old, that's old, and then the Old Testament, yeah, right? So, um, there's lots of things in the Old Testament that people still adhere to. Um, Ten Commandments, for instance. Yeah, Ten Commandments. They want them in the schools, they don't, they don't in the throw courthouses, in, wherever else. Yeah, they don't throw it out because it's in the Old Testament. So, if raping is in the Old Testament, just like the old, uh, Ten Commandments are in the Old Testament. Now, I don't think you can throw them out. You can't I throw mean, them anywhere. I, I like that Christians, for the most part, are rejecting the slavery and the rape and everything like that. That's based that's, on That's a, a good thing, because we, we've seen the society has changed. We've realized that those things were bad. Well, and obviously, rejecting certain things about what tells them to do or tells them it's okay for them to do. But uh, if they were truly, if they were, you know, well, once again, like you said, they realize it's wrong, it's immoral, it's, uh, it's repugnant to do something like that to someone. So if they realize, if they realize that, I don't know what they still need to um, look to that book for at all. If, if even one thing in there is that bad, then the whole thing should be touched. Well, for the people listening live, if you'd like to call in and Skype, call in in about five minutes and we'll start taking calls. On the comment of the last thing, I, I think we could actually take the Bible, as Bert Ehrman says, we could take a kind of a, a mythical faith kind of idea where we can just look at the stories and take what we like out of them but not actually literally believe in the supernatural claims. We can. Right. So, well, even theists could do that. A lot of they, the can. The they can. <laughs> a lot of theologians I have spoken to in the past, it seems like what they believe is a metaphor. They don't actually literally believe in an actual God out there that exists, but rather, you know, it's it's a it's a being, it's um with within literature and all these other things I've heard, it seems really vague. And sometimes with liberal theists, you, you get that. And okay, great. It's glad that you realize that some of these verses are really bad. But don't don't call it the good book. Just call it a good book or a good piece of literature because it, we can gain from it in that case. That's true. You don't need to adhere to it and say, uh, this is this is my rule book that I learned from and adhere to, and this is why I want to live my life because they're not they're not actually running around living their life based on that book. Um, if they were, they'd be incarcerated or, or probably killed themselves for doing the things the Bible tells them to do. So we don't see any any surges across the country or around the world. People are running around 
just raping and saying, oh, I'm a Christian, it's my right to rape, it's in the book, uh, I can own slaves too, and, um, <laughs> you know, things of that nature. <laughs> well, they're still going around using the book as justification for some issues. Yeah, but once again, that's cherry picking. Right. Um, if the book is supposed to be the inherent word of God, he's God's perfect um, word, and God uh, um, sent his word down to man to put it in the book form, written form, then I don't understand why they would cherry pick at all. They should uh, pretty much try to do their best to stand by all the all the, uh, the, the rules and regulations of the book. Yeah, we got into a little bit before, maybe some um, listeners are familiar with Euthyphro's Dilemma, the idea that if morality comes from a god, it's arbitrary and it's a might makes right morality. So it seems like there has to be some kind of outside standard that we have to appeal for for morality or that god would. So it seems like appealing to god really doesn't work for morality at all. It's a significant problem that's been around for about 2,000 years. Well, when you mentioned might makes right, uh, I was talking some the other day about um, Bible passages where supposedly God ordered men to go and kill off whole whole lands and take um, what they wanted to take. In this case, they were taking just uh, virgin virgin daughters, women, uh, little girls, okay, uh, and killing the men, wild women, uh, sons. And sometimes they even kill animals. I guess animals are wicked, but. Um, <laughs> if you lie with animals, then they're killed too in Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Okay. So. But um, it seems clear that any time it specifies take all the versions for yourself as, as bound booty of, of the spoils of war. Yeah. Where, where they're going with that. Oh, yeah, the apologists say, well, never said rape, just to take them. Because they've seen all the people killed, and it wasn't that so horrifying. You, know, yeah. you, you should take the people out and live them to a better life, right? Well, I doubt that anyone who's, who's a hostage, who's just watched their family and their whole village murdered and burnt or whatever the case was, ran through with swords, would happily go along with some stranger. Oh, this is my new life. I guess I'm just your property now. I don't think that's how it worked. I don't care how long ago it was. I'm sure there was um, there was a problem there. Um, it doesn't matter how far you go back. I don't believe. I don't think that anybody with a mind of their own would want somebody to do that to them. All right, at this point, we're going to take some callers. Um, hopefully, everything will work well on the tech side, and we'll have a conversation with some people listening. Perhaps you'd like to talk about some Bible verses that you find curious. Perhaps you'd like to comment on some things we've said. So let's get some calls. Nobody right at the moment. We okay. Have, we don't have anybody online right now. So, okay. so what do you think about, um, for example, organizations like the Westboro Baptist Church? who will say, this is our interpretation, and other sects will say, well, this is our interpretation, so how can we really find out who's right in the matter, or who's more or less biblical? Um, if I had to look at it that way, I guess I would say that um, if someone wanted to look into um, what group was more was more credible, I guess they have to do a thorough inquire their own to see what their what their message is and you know, where they're getting their information from, what they're about, what their goals are, so on and so forth, um, versus the other groups that are out there. Um, there's, there's, there's groups that are very radical, groups that are docile, but if they're all based on a God and supernatural beliefs and stuff like that, then it really doesn't matter to me, personally, um, how many, how many uh, good parts they have or, or what their message is, if they're going to say, well, it's all based on this ancient book that uh, we, we, we believe God made possible. So um, Westboro Baptist Church or whoever, I mean they are radical. Westboro Baptist Church is extremely radical based on the way, you know, the things they're doing and the fashion they're doing it. Um, but they're just, I guess, I guess in their case, they're willing to go out there and, and ex express what they believe or don't believe in um, for everybody to see. They're not concerned about people seeing them or uh, confrontation, things like that. Uh, when in other cases, other other religionists might pretty much keep all their beliefs um, secret. Uh, they won't even bother to go out and do anything based on what their beliefs are. So just sit back and just hold a belief. But once again, like I said, the uh, the belief itself is a problem I have. I mean, you might be radical or non-radical, but if you hold these beliefs, I feel as though that you, that's, the starting point is, was wrong to begin with. Right. Well, it's it's kind of interesting because we see a lot of different interpretations and people just try to pull things out of the sky. And like we said before, some people use the free will defense and say, well, the reason God won't intervene is because of free will. But we see a lot of passages in the Bible where God does intervene. 
and a lot earlier in history, according to some passages in the Bible, miracles were commonplace. Mm -hmm. But now the best we really see, it seems, is the Virgin Mary on toast, and it seems to be much less impressive. So if these people saw Jesus come back from the dead, or Jesus walking on water, manna falling from the sky, whatever else, how are they able to use the free will defense there? Because these people who experienced miracles would have lost their free will, right? So we'll see. Um, the thing with the free will, uh, some might even say, well, if there is free will, I mean, personally, I believe we have, we have no choice but to have free will, okay? <laughs> but when somebody says that um, they're exercising their free will and that um, God has given you free will, um, I think that's incredible because people will make that claim now, this could be a whole other podcast <laughs> now. You could debate That's free true. will. I don't want to go That's all right. Yeah. But the claim that, that, that God has given them free will is nonsense. Um, Maybe some callers will call in and talk about that. Who knows? Well, if, 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 if God gave you free will, what sense is there? I mean, if you want to say to God, say through prayer, ask for things or, or ask God for things not to happen bad or whatever, but people have free will to do anything they want to do. That's a conflict. I would think that's a conflict. Yeah, it's God intervening on behalf of other people, and it seems to be taking away their free will in that case, according to the standards they're putting out there. So if you're going to ask for intervention, say, for example, getting $1,000 in the mail, well, won't that interfere with the Social Security Administration or whomever might send it to you? If God is responsible for sending that money? Should be. It seems pretty strange. Oops. And you, you also have the problem... And this could be a whole other podcast, too, but it's worth mentioning that if God knows the future, and we get back to the, the Jephthah thing, where God, in many cases, theists would say, knows everything. He knows the future. He knew that Jephthah's daughter would walk through that door, and he was totally okay with that vow, and it just went by. So God was okay with him offering his daughter as a burnt offering. Well, it's also curious that if God knows everything, past, present, and future, and he supposedly created all of mankind... He would know precisely how each and every man or woman would turn out. If, if his uh, God senses told him <laughs> that Rodney and Justin were going to be atheists in the future, I don't understand why he would bother creating us if we were going to be uh, against him or against Can't understand word. the mind of God, Rodney, <laughs> in mysterious be ways. But that's all right, because I can still think for myself and ask questions. Be because <laughs> us doing this podcast or being atheists is inspiring people to be more faithful, you see. Maybe that's what it is. I guess that that's what it would have to be. Uh, versus, versus what makes more sense. <laughs> um, because, like I said before, if um, God says that he will, he will have you sent to hell and torture for eternity for your non-belief, it wouldn't make a drop of sense that he would create you in the first place if he knew you were going to be like that. that that's ridiculous. Um, God, if God knows everything, then he shouldn't be just disappointed in anything. Why would, why would a God be disappointed? I can't, I can't figure that one out. <laughs> well, it's up to them, I guess. If anyone's um, listening to the live stream right now, you can send in a question via Skype if you'd like, or perhaps type something in the chat room. We can address that. Or maybe you could possibly enlighten us, because we do have questions of our own. Like I just said, uh, God is out there, and God wants to uh, give us, supposedly, according to Christians, like the mind we have, to use and think for ourselves, well, we're supposed to be thinking for ourselves as far as I'm concerned. But if God gave us a mind that we can think for ourselves with, and we decide not to be religious, I don't understand how God would be disappointed if he already knew which way we would go. So I, well, think, that's, I think that's a pretty good question. Yeah, they'll, they'll say it's on us, and that's where they go back to the free will. Well, or... don't, don't, don't give them <laughs> They're calling and break and explain, because, I mean, if they're, 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 if they're out there, which I know they're out there, uh, maybe they want to contact us and let us know from their own experiences or their knowledge, supposed knowledge of uh, what it, what's going on when it comes to this free will stuff and um, God having a problem with us not being believers. I think that that's uh, worth 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 it looking into there. We we have um, no choice but to be how we are now if it's the case that God knows future truths, because since God is omniscient, none of His beliefs can be wrong. So it seems like we really have no choice in that matter. It's forced. Mm -hmm. It's a quick and dirty version of the problem anyway. Okay, gotcha. So a, a lot of people um, you might hear will say things like, we need the Bible 
back in schools or I've heard that. you know we, we should be teaching th- there was the letter to the editor we commented on a few podcasts ago about how the bible needs to be taught at Penn State because that will apparently stop child rape so so do you think that would be a good idea teaching this this bible and are people really gaining morals from it no it wouldn't be a good idea and we wouldn't be gaining any morals from it um I didn't hear about people pushing their, their agenda for having uh, um, the scripture of at Penn State before the raping. Okay. Not, <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure there was. I mean, they may have been saying that <laughs> here and there, but when the raping situation, the child molestation thing came came on board, that's when they really started oh, saying. Oh, we heard the pregame prayer, right, about how God is going to protect the children and God is blessing the game today. So well, somebody that gave that pregame, um, whatever they said, they lied. Because obviously that's, that's not the case. That they're protecting the children. <laughs> they told a lie. At that, at so that much for the, the free will there that they used. They, that's, they try to try to dupe folks. But if, um, like I said before, I don't believe they were pushing their agenda wholeheartedly before they found out that all these little children were being taken advantage of. Now they found out, now they had all kinds of scapegoats. It's the gays in the community. They're, they're making this happen. And... Uh, we need God involved. If God was around and involved at all, he wouldn't be. He wouldn't allow these men to get away with that in the first place, taking advantage of little children. It would have been found out a long time ago. It would have taken lives ruined and you know, things like that for, for before we found out about it. They had to start talking about, well, now let's instill the Bible into this. We don't need a Bible. We need men <laughs> to keep their hands off of little boys. That's what we need to uh, have more, proper morals. We don't need any uh, gods. Uh, we, don't, we don't see on a daily basis on the news, like in our neighborhood or our area, just constant molestation of little children going on every day, all around us, all the time. Because no, most people know how immoral and, and heinous that is, and they usually don't uh, delve into that type of uh, heinousness. But once once somebody does and they're discovered, all of a sudden, well, what they need is, according to them, what they need is more religion. They need God. We need God. No, you don't. What you need is more morals. Apparently, anybody who was willing to do that to a child is sick. They need to get themselves some help, or help needs to be given to them. They don't need a book telling you to rape people. To, uh, stop raping people is ridiculous. <laughs> well, then you, you have the case where some of the rapists, of course, are religious, so it doesn't seem like the Bible is just to get out of jail free card here. That, you know, no religious people, I mean, I'm sure there's rape across the board for all kind of demographics. So it seems like that just isn't the issue. But then they might say, well, if there were more of it, then there wouldn't be this and that, but then we can go to the Catholic Church and appeal to other things, and it doesn't seem to work for them there. But you would think that perhaps if God did intervene, um, I guess someone like Sandusky could have had a heart attack, and God induced the heart attack, and nobody knew it was God or something else happened. Um, you know, if if God could intervene and not make it known to us, I guess we wouldn't lose the free will there under their accounting. So do you, do you think that if Sandusky were to, say, slip in the shower or something, or something were to happen where the children weren't raped, do you think we would just totally lose free will there if indeed we have it? No. Um, first of all, if, if something was to happen to Sandusky before he had a chance to rape little kids, we would probably have never known he had intentions of raping little kids. It would have, either he'd have been dead or whatever the case is, and he wouldn't have had his chance. Um, as far as um, that goes, he, he basically, like I said before, I remember on the earlier podcast, he, these people took advantage of their position. And they got away with it for a while now. Um, if there was a God, I would think that, if anything, maybe he would have um, made it so that Sandusky would have been caught, you know what I mean, his initial raping, um, so that it would have been brought to light. If there was a God that loved and you know, was just and things of that nature, um, and then maybe Sandusky could have gotten help. I mean, apparently he does need help from one way of seeming, but if, if, if there was a God that knew of this, that sees everything, has a problem with that, uh, Sandusky should never have gotten as far as he done gotten. But we both know that when it comes down to uh, the things men decide to do, there we don't believe there's a God that's going to intervene in any shape, form, or fashion. So it's based on the minds of men and how they want to perform in life. So uh, a guy like Sandusky who may have done that, uh, he needs to pay. He's, he needs to he needs to pay pay the price for that if he's if he's guilty of that. Uh, I don't believe about any guys want to make him suffer. Like I said, you got a book. Uh, a so-called good book that talks about raping, like it's a good thing. So I don't know how people are running around saying we need to use the book to help us out now because children are being raped. That just seems completely backwards. And you also hear that God does intervene and help people perform well on tests in school, 
Um, that would be finding a, finding their car keys. Wouldn't that be cheating? Uh, I, I don't know. That, that's well, if, that's if, a tough one. <laughs> if, you, if you and I were going to school together, and we both had the same class and the same test, and I studied really, really hard, and all you did was said a prayer and studied a little tiny bit, <laughs> um, and God supposedly assisted you, I would think that would be a form of cheating. Because I would think that if you were in school, you could think for yourself and study hard and get the grades. If you don't study hard, usually you don't get the grades, you fail. So if someone goes into a test and starts praying, should they be considered cheating? Well, technically I don't believe they're cheating because I don't believe in a God. But for those that do believe in a God, that should be considered a form of cheating. Because like I said, um, if, you, if your own skills aren't enough, your own, your, own, your own mind that you have to use to ascertain things, to learn, um, and you need to ask some some uh, being to, to help you get through this, to help you pass. Now, like I said before, I don't believe in it, but they surely do. And if that was true, that a God was out there helping certain people pass tests, to me that would be a form of cheating. A lot of theists will try to redefine prayer and say it's just um, asking for inspiration and not exactly, say, giving an answer on a test, but it's just communication with God. And God isn't necessarily answering back in many cases. Kind of like a pump-up thing in a way, it seems. Well, I don't understand why they would need to be inspired if they're already in school and they know they have tests coming up um, and they're already religious. Why would they need to be inspired for, you know, for, for doing, having a test, taking a test? Um, if they know that they're, they're going to fail and flunk out or whatever, that should be inspiring enough to know you're not going <laughs> to reach your goals, that you're going to fail in life and not you know, make your, maybe reach your goals and be what you want to be. So as far as the God thing goes, like I said, that, that's ridiculous because um, we, we all know that. Hard work pretty much usually gets you where you, you know gets you where you're trying to go. Not not prayer. I don't know. I've, I've never seen uh, any tests for prayer that prove that prayer works. In any case, so I've seen the opposite in many cases. If you can Google the step study, there was a study where a lot of heart patients were asking for petitionary prayer. A group knew they were being prayed for. A group was uncertain about the prayer. And the group was told they're not being prayed for, I believe. And the group that knew they were being prayed for and ended up faring worse in the study. So, I mean, it's really hard to detect it there. But as far as some kind of intervention or petitionary prayer is concerned, it seems like that doesn't work. That's, of course, one study, but this was well-funded. And a lot of other literature is out there that we'll include in the show notes for the podcast. Well, uh, they need to run more tests. And... Uh... That way they can they can give examples more and more examples of the um, the truth of the matter when it comes to whether these things work for people or not because anybody wants to go around and say that they can they can do things or make things happen through prayer and then sometimes or a lot of times things don't go the way they planned or the way they want them to go and they're just they fall apart sometimes they can't they can't get over it uh, that that can harm people sometimes the, the belief itself can be harmful. Um, or how can I put it, um, disappointing, I guess. Some people want to pray and ask God for things and that things don't happen. But uh, once again, like I said, if you know what you want what you want out of life or you know where you want to be, you know what your goals are, you're going to have to work for them. Uh, asking a, a God to give it to you or to make it happen or to give you strength or whatever, uh, I would say look within yourself for strength since you already know what you want, you know who you are, where you want to go. You should be able to handle or grapple with life on, you know, on its own terms on your own without bothering to uh, look up to the sky or whatever or hop on your, jump on your knees and, oh, Lord, help me, deliver me, do this, do that, so on and so forth. So I, I personally believe that people that do that are, to some extent, kind of weak because not, not everybody has to do that, but some people decide they want to do that. And um, like I said, that's not, that's not the case. It doesn't, it doesn't, that doesn't help you pass a test. If they want to say they were inspired, Okay, that sounds nice, but I think there's other re other good reasons that they were actually studied hard. Or yeah, whatever the case might be. You know, yeah, it's, it's not it's not going to be the case that people don't study at all and they're just going to get a hundred across the board. Mm -hmm. I think we'd be able to demonstrate that in some way. Mm -hmm. But we want to look at the most plausible explanation without appealing to the supernatural. We can have a lot of really good explanations for a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. You you were saying um, sometimes um, in in the Black Baptist Church there there would be a lot of petitionary prayer and the the crowd goes wild and you, it's kind of like a pep rally where the the preacher's talking everybody just goes goes nuts and the Holy Spirit is in them and they're talking to God in that case but it doesn't seem like anything is really resulting from that 
you no, know, it's um, it's a community of like minds who believe in the same thing. Who pretty much just, I guess, they're having a good time and they're doing what they're doing it together. But I don't see anything coming out of it really, other than a happy feeling um, when they're in there. <clears throat> excuse me, when they're in there in church and uh, sermon, sermon, sermon is going on. For instance, the, the pastor, or preacher, or priest, whoever is at at the pulpit giving his uh, sermon, and usually they try to make it rousing. So that people are really, you know, uh, on the edge of their seat, like, you know, oh boy, you know, you got, got my attention, you know, <laughs> drum beat. Yeah. And they, they might have they might have a band in the background playing musical instruments and uh, you know, it's like like I said about one of the back Baptist church I went to when I was younger, we didn't have a band. I know they have a band in there now. Um I listen to podcasts uh of the sermons from that church and um this it sounds like more like like I said, like you said, pep rally there and they're amping people. I doubt if you went to a church and the pastor gave a stinking, a stinky sermon that you were like, oh, that, that, that sucked. <laughs> you're going to start putting your money in a plate, you know? Or you're going to be flopping on the floor, speaking yeah. in tongues. So I think the more that they get you amped up or revved up or whatever you want to call it, the more you're willing to give and be a part of this. So I think it's more psychology than anything else. Um, but I've seen too many, too many so-called theists out of church who do claim to be devout. Who are having the toughest times in life. Uh, one guy I know is homeless, but he's going to be a devout Christian, and he gives his all to God, and he's homeless. He's lost pretty much everything. He's got no trouble. Hmm? And Pat Robertson said that, you know, even if you're struggling in these hard economic times, you should still be tithing the same amount. So yeah, there's a lot sure of... He'll say that, and his pockets keep getting fatter, too. <laughs> Pat Robertson, he says a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> is that, that, that macaroni and cheese... Uh, around Thanksgiving, he had this um, one thing where he said his macaroni and cheese is a black thing. Yeah. So he's I he's all that. over the place. Sometimes it is a black thing. <laughs> Sometimes it's not. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he's, he's ignorant. He's very ignorant. I don't know how it is. He, I guess he just likes to stir things up for attention so that people can... I guess he, he doesn't care about negative attention. As as he gets attention. Maybe he really believes all this stuff. I don't know. <laughs> well, he might believe all this stuff. Um, but I know whether he does or doesn't, he's getting his pockets are getting fatter. That's, that's a fact. Well, how about um, on the topic of prayer, about Rick Perry, who issued his prayer declaration for rain. And we also, in Pennsylvania, experienced the mayor of Harrisburg, Linda Thompson, who called for three days of prayer and fasting mm -hmm. in order to help balanced budget yes. in Harrisburg. I'm aware of that. And we see that that's tremendously failed. Yes. Except for when Tim Minchin came to Texas a few months after, I think, this declaration it started to rain, but there are all the wildfires and everything before that, so it seems like praying to God for rain isn't a good policy politically, unless that gets you more votes, I guess. Maybe they should have gotten a hold of some, some Native Indians and had them do a rain dance. I mean, that'd be better for them, because apparently their guy's not helping them. If they want rain and <laughs> things of that nature, I guess they're going to have to uh, try something new, since they want to be supernatural about it. Um, rather than being supernatural, they're supernatural about things, they need to become scientific about things, uh, to some degree at least, and start studying how things work and how things don't work. Tides come in, tides come out. Tides go in, tides go out. I find it amazing. A lot of times I'll find theists who run around making all sorts of claims, way outside of their religious beliefs, and when you question them about it, they'll, they'll say, well, I don't really know much about it, but I, I think this or I think that. <laughs> so I'll say, okay, well, you're entitled to your opinion, but don't you, aren't you concerned about looking and sounding ignorant? Well, they're legally entitled to their opinion, but maybe not morally so. Mm -hmm. But they never seem to be interested or concerned about how they look or sound until somebody like you and I come along and say, well, hold on a second. That's not right, and here's why. Then... There's a, there's, a big, uh, there's a big stir going on. Well, that's what happened um, recently with the controversy with the local chiropractor, Dan Golsheski. I criticized him on my blog, taking direct claims from his radio show, his website, and elsewhere, and I got legal threats for doing that. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, the, in our meetings, podcasts, whatever else we do, we get criticism, we, we answer the criticism without personal attacks, threats, legal threats anything like that. So it seems like it's an intellectually honest position to have the conversations with people instead of just, I, I think this, I think that, um, don't, don't challenge my beliefs, whatever else. I would, I would personally think that if Dr. Dan was legitimate, he wouldn't be making any threats at all. He would pretty much say, okay, well, you, you challenge, you challenging me? Well, let's get down to it. Here's, here's why you're wrong, Justin. But instead, it's, we'll sue you. <laughs>
that's that's you can translate that into leave us alone. <laughs> yeah, and we both have the formats too. He has a radio show. We have the podcast here. So mm -hmm. there's no lack of platform. And the religious challenge is still out to the community. Although I'll be debating Reverend Dotson this Monday, other people can still take it up, of course. Of course. You know, the challenge will always be there because you always have different folks from different walks of life who might want to come in and have a different take on things. Yeah. So it's definitely, you know, doors open. So if you're out there listening and you want to you take up the challenge and straighten things out, if we're confused or we got it wrong, we're more than welcome to uh, take up the challenge, contact us, and let us know. We're not, we won't be going anywhere. We'll be waiting for to hear from you. All right. And thank you for listening.